This is my favorite course to teach, as some of you may have guessed from last term. Um, we're going to talk about all the different viruses which are up here on the screen, um, particularly this virus here, which is in fact one that I discovered um, in Yellowstone National Park. It's the STIV virus. Um, these are the SSV viruses that most of my lab works on. So it's the virus CCMV that a lab that I used to work in works on, um, and then adenovirus and bacteria phage T4. Um, still working on trying to move this thing around here. Um, this is basically my contact information here. We'll get into that in a little bit more detail as we move through here. Uh, one thing that I've been told to tell everybody is I'm on Facebook. My lab made a Facebook page for me. Um, there's a lot of stuff which is on there as well. So where do you find me? Again, most of you know this already. I know a couple of you in particular who are very good at finding me. So maybe I can move forward here. It's trying to get a new computer, so hopefully it's going to make things better. Um, except for this silly uh, eye clicker thing, which is supposed to be better now. Whether it is in fact better or not is probably open to question. So uh, where do you find me? 466 SRTC. Um, Science Research and Teaching Center, it's the one over on 10th Avenue, the building that used to be known as Science Building 2. How many people remember when it was still called Science Building 2? Not very many of you, so I'm going to stop calling it that soon. Um, office hours are right after class. I'm not sure if I'm going to be having them in here directly. I don't know if there's a class right after this one or not. Otherwise, over in my office over there. Um, I'm also here pretty much Monday to Friday, 8.30ish to 5ish. So um, you can also schedule some office hours outside of that time. Uh, by far and away, the best way to reach me is via my email address. I'm kind of email dependent um, and answer it far too often. You can try and reach me through D2L mail. That's um, something I read maybe once a day, if you're lucky. Um, this one's probably every 30 seconds or so, not quite that bad. Um, and you can try leaving me a voicemail if you like. I'm not very good about responding to those. Um, again, we're on Facebook. Um, I actually post a lot of new things, new stuff that I think is cool viral stuff. Um, I'll post that on the Facebook page. So if you're interested in that, um, take a look at it. YouTube channel. Um, any of you who have been in my classes before know that that's where I post all of the lectures after I'm done with them. That's why I set up the recording here for Camtasia at the beginning. Hopefully it's working this time, but also all previous year's lectures are on there as well. So if you want to get some heads up uh, prep beforehand for the lecture, you can go back and look at the previous year's lecture. They will change a little bit because there's been some exciting new stuff going on in terms of virology. What might that be? Um, in particularly in the last couple of years um, and even in the last couple of months, literally. Um, so that's the, the link here to my YouTube channel. Um, my web page is a little bit more detail on some of the stuff that we do in my lab, and it's, like most pages, ridiculously out of date. Um, this is um, one of my favorite viruses here, um, which I brought a nice 3D model. This is my favorite, current favorite virus, um, SSV. Probably not going to stand up very well here. Um, one of my buddies made a 3D model of this, the uh, SSV1 um, virus. This is over in the office there. So you can't find you know, this guy, look for that guy. A couple things that people almost always ask me about um, having to do with prerequisites for this course. Um, how many of you have not taken molecular biology? OK, a couple of you. Um, we should probably talk about uh, this class, because I will assume that you've had molecular biology in the past. and. What some people have done in this class before is say every time that I mention, you remember from molecular biology, they make a little mark in their book. I think I got up to 52 once. Um, so <clears throat> if you haven't had molecular biology, I think this course will be a challenge for you. Um, it's certainly doable. I've had people who've taken it and done just fine without. Um, but I will uh, make a lot of assumptions in terms of molecular biology. Because one of the really fascinating things about viruses is they often do things in very different ways than what we sort of think about as the standard cellular um, molecular biology. Cell biology, um, how many people haven't had cell biology or are taking it now? Okay, that's plenty of you. Should not be a big deal. I've talked to quite a few of you about this already. 
uh, there'll be a few things in terms of subcellular um, compartments and so on and so forth that are really not such a big deal as far as this course is concerned and it should be pretty easy to fill in some of that. Um, again, if you have any questions about this, um, please talk to me about it. What are we going to talk about in this course? Um, this is a molecular virology course. That's because that's my main interest in viruses and how amazingly cool they are in terms of the different kinds of molecular biology that they use. Um, we're going to use, there's just two schools of how to teach virology. One is to do virus by virus, which is kind of the way we do it. Um, and I like it for a number of different reasons that we can get into later. The other one is to sort of cover major kinds of themes in terms of DNA replication, RNA replication, um, transcription, translation, etc. Um, again, there are reasons to do that, and I'll be trying to tie some of that together a little bit later on. Um, mostly doing that because of these major classes of viruses. Um, and basically, this is how they replicate. Um, you have DNA viruses, you have RNA viruses, you have retroviruses. Um, and this course is really going to cover the gamut, going all the way from a nice little bacteriophage. And here's my bacteriophage model, bacteriophage <laughs> 4, um, giant microbes, all the way through the most fascinating viruses of all, um, like this one, but um, also HIV and some of the other viruses, which are um, things that people care a lot about. Uh, main thing here, again, it's going to be about how the virus makes more of itself. Um, it has to do with making more of the genome of the virus. It has to do with making the genes that the virus needs to make more of itself. And then one of the things that is really unique to viruses is this extracellular part of viruses, the virion. How do virions get put together. And that's one of the, I think, most fascinating and unanswered questions as far as how you can have this really unique life cycle of how viruses work. We'll talk a little bit about pathogenesis. I'm sorry, I know a number of you are pre-health professionals um, and you'd really love to hear about how viruses make you sick. Um, I know a very small amount about that, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. A lot of that has to do with immunology. It's how our body's sort of responding to ourself um, in many different ways. And there's uh, a lot of things however, that do tie together having to do with virus replication um, and pathogenesis, but a lot of stuff that has very little to do with that um, at all. We, of course, have to do evaluation, everybody's favorite part of the course. Um, this should sound really familiar for those of you had molecular biology, making another little mark there. Uh, basically, three midterms, um, two regular midterms, uh, going to be on the 18th of April and the 11th of May. One final, which is non-cumulative, so basically, again, just like another midterm, that'll be on the 9th of June. That's a Tuesday at 8 a.m. That's the regular exam schedule for this course, so um, 8 a.m. for that. All the exams are 50 multiple choice questions um, and the blue form on the Scantron. Uh, I post almost, I think all the ones I can find anyway, all the old exams on D2L. Um, so you can go and take a look at them. One of the things I'm not very good about is posting exams that don't have answers on D2L. And so people just need to remind me that I want should do that. Um, I try and make new questions every year, but again, those of you who've had molecular biology, know that quite often um, questions end up being very similar, even if they are completely new, and I promise they are completely new, even if they don't sound like they are. Um, most of you, of course, will have noticed that we're only at 90% here. We have the rest, the last 10%. Um, those are clicker questions. Uh, the main thing about clicker questions is not to torture you, um, even though some people may think that's the case. Um, it's really to get feedback from you during the class, before the class. Give me an opportunity to try and talk through a few more things, things that I think are particularly important from previous lectures, but what I'm going to do differently this term rather than last term, as I did mention last term, is also try and do clicker questions through the course. So not just the beginning, 
so that people can push their clicker and leave. Um, so to try and continue through the class, because I think it's also important feedback-wise. Um, if I think you all understand exactly how this thing more or less represents a virus, um, and you really don't, um, it would be a good thing for me to know that rather than sort of pushing my way through the whole rest of the course. Um, so, yes, we'll do clickers. They will start counting next week. Um, how many of you don't have a clicker? Okay, so not very many of you. That's, that's good. Um, that, again, will be 10% of your grade. Any device um, works for this. So any of these guys over here, um, iClicker 1, iClicker 2, iClicker Plus, um, don't care. Uh, really doesn't matter. Um, unfortunately, I can't do the cell phone, the reef polling uh, for a number of different reasons that we can talk about later. So any device. Um, you can get them, I think, on Amazon for like 15 bucks. So they're really not ridiculous. Uh, need to register these on D2L. There's a link on D2L. I know a number of you have already filled in that link um, by the first midterm, which again is the 18th of April. And so now so many of you have your clickers already, we can do a non-graded clicker question here, um, which is, which of the following do you consider yourself? Um, junior molecular biology major, senior molecular biology major, sorry, biology major, not molecular. You can have a biology major, not molecular, that's okay, I don't mind. Um, post back, junior, senior, non-biology, or none of the above. And if I could actually get this thing to start, see, that's the problem with switching computers here. They doesn't like me. Eh, how do we start? What is the channel we want to be on? Um, should be AA, yeah. <clears throat> So, okay. I guess I need to use this guy. If in doubt, alternate technology. Base frequency code is AA. Good. Close. Yay! It's working, I think. Kind of, sort of. And thank you, by the way, to those of you who have um, actually registered. So. Uh, See, so eventually I'll work out how this podium thing works here. I promise. Does anyone else want to vote? No? Vote early, vote often? The best American way? Okay, so only three of you, 33 of you want to admit what kind of uh, major you are. Um, again, this, this will not be graded. Maybe I need to actually grade it next time so people uh, will answer more. Okay, so... Um, stop that. <clears throat> um, do you want to know what the answers are? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, juniors, seniors, postbacks, uh, <clears throat> juniors are non-majors, and then nobody's none of the above, or they didn't want to vote, as the case may be. Okay, there's no correct answer to this, just in case you were wondering. Okay, so, um, other thing, again, Ash mark. Um, same as molecular biology. Um, I normalize the top score to 100%, and then 90% of that's an A, etc., um, all the way down. Um, these are minimums. Um, usually, what happens is we've got a couple of outliers, and some of you know who you are, um, and I know who you are as well. Um, then we'll lower that normalization a little bit. And that's again what happened in molecular biology. That's pretty much always what happens um, in these courses. I did have a fellow in here once who came to me in office hours about midway through the course. Um, I had noticed he was doing extremely well on exams. He said, oh, by the way, um, I'm an anesthesiologist. This is my midlife crisis coming and taking my classes. <laughs> um, so we did actually end up cutting him off the top of the normalization, and he ended up doing a PhD in my lab. So um, <laughs> Um, other exam policy things, I just need to say this, um, they're all closed book, again, little hash mark there. Uh, no time limits, um, again, we'll see if anybody's in here afterwards. Um, if there are people coming in, we'll move outside, you can have as long as you need um, to finish these. Um, however, as soon as anybody leaves, again, because it's a closed book, um, I have to then not allow anybody to start the exam after that. And so <clears throat> what that means is basically just be here on time. Um, if you would like to take the exam elsewhere and you've talked to the DRC about this, 
let me know and please remind me before exams because I'm really good at forgetting about that and then people will show up at the testing center and there won't be a test for them. So um, please remind me. Um, I'm sure none of you are going to do this, but um, if you do, um, you'll get a zero for that particular exam. I do not require you being here. Um, a lot of people, in fact, I think last term in you know, that other course that I taught, um, someone had zero points for clickers but still ended up getting an A. So it's possible they did really, really well on the exams. Uh, but, <clears throat> that's, uh, but I do still highly recommend this. This is uh, just a uh, screen. You remember the last question on the exam last time, so I collect the data. Uh, people who always come to class generally do a lot better than people who rarely come to class. Uh, but just if you always come to class doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to do well. Um, so these are, and these of course are self-reported as well, so take them all with a somewhat of a grain of salt. If there are extreme circumstances, things happen, molecular biology two years ago, first lecture of the term, I was in the ER. So I thought it was a pretty good excuse for not being there. Um, but so there are, things happen, life happens. Uh, so if there are really extreme circumstances, and I need evidence for that just to be fair to the other people in the class who've made a big effort to actually be here. Um, we can do makeup exams, there'll be essay exams, and if for some reason the Scantron gets scanned incorrectly, etc., these things happen, um, just let me know within a week and uh, <coughs> I will recheck them. Um, we scan all of our Scantrons, and so we've got copies of all of them. So um, I can go back and check those really easily, which also means if you change them, your score is going to go down a lot. So any questions about exams, et cetera? Um, it should be, again, hopefully pretty obvious that I've posted a lot of mine too well. So how do you do well in this course? Um, one is to <coughs> check out the textbook. Um, it's pretty well written. Um, one of the things that I do like about this textbook is, again, like the way we're doing the course, it's really split up into the different virus families, different kinds of viruses. Um, also talks quite a bit about, talks quite a bit about, um, have a couple of chapters on bacteriophage. Not in fact on this one, curiously enough. Um, not on bacteriophage T4, which we may get around to talking about. Does, one of the very few textbooks that actually talks about archaeal viruses. So um, that's also a big plus with this textbook. There are a couple of things that I also particularly like about the text. It's one of the reasons I keep using it. Uh, there are nice chapter overviews at the beginnings of each chapter. So if you're thinking about reviewing things for, say, exams, a um, great place to go and take a look at the overview of what's going on there. There's also a nice glossary and a number of references uh, in the actual textbook to a lot of primary literature. Yeah? Is it in the bookstore? The textbook should be in the bookstore. I haven't gone and checked because I actually have my own copy. <laughs> Course reserves in the library. I took um, this copy, so the second edition is also a first edition, which is lacking in some important things like archaeal viruses. Um, I took two versions of that over to the library right before spring break, so hopefully they're there. Has anybody looked for them in the library yet? Yeah, they're there. Okay, so um, they're there, two hour um, loan on those, so those are available. There also is an ebook version of this if people prefer um, ebooks and I think it's a little cheaper. Uh, okay, other questions on the, the text? I'll, I'll bring my, my copy with you, uh, with me. Um, D2L, I put up the lecture notes. Um, I just posted this time I'm switching over to Keynote for a couple of reasons, one of which I didn't get to do today. Um, <clears throat> But uh, also PDF versions. Do people want PowerPoint versions as well? Yes, no. How many would really like me to do PowerPoints too? Okay, we've got a few of you. Um, I can, I'll see, I'll, I'll do these ones first and then if I have some time I'll put in the PowerPoints as well. Um, I try and get them posted by 10 o'clock at night the night before because that's about when I crash. Um, and you know, some people uh, also want to get them beforehand. Uh, also on D2L, again, um, oh, sorry, also this year's um, and last year's lecture recordings, all on YouTube. Um, I think I've got 400 subscribers. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> not sure how many of them actually watch or go back and check things. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, um, they're all on, on YouTube. I'm not very good about organizing them. 
Um, but the easiest way to see if there's a new posting is just to subscribe. Again, it's not about me having numbers of people on YouTube. Um, <clears throat> but if you subscribe, then whenever I post that particular new lecture, you'll get an email that will pop up. Um, again, this is the YouTube channel. Uh, the other thing you need to do is ask lots of questions because that slows me down. Always thought to be a good thing. Um, and <clears throat> hopefully allows me to explain things in a slightly different way. So that's hopefully how you do well um, in this course is to check those things out. Um, again, a reminder, D2L, got the syllabus on there. It'll give you an idea when we're going to cover the different things and also most of the stuff we've already talked about. That's where I post the lectures, all the old exams, actually almost all the old keys because that's why I post the keys after the exam's done. So it's really easy to have the keys up there. Um, again, I need to be reminded to post the actual exams that don't have uh, the answers on them. Please go ahead and do that. Uh, some more supplemental materials and readings. Uh, some of you who may have looked, anybody looked at the syllabus yet? Yes, some of you. Um, anybody read the extra reading that's there? No. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there are some <clears throat> extra readings that I put up there. One of the things with virology is it's a very fast moving field. There's also a lot of, at least I think, and I'm kind of biased, interesting stuff, um, which gets posted. Um, a lot of the extra readings that I'll give are not going to be primary literature readings. They'll be secondary, so a news report or something like that on things. And so the uh, Age of Phage, which I think is the one which I posted this time. Uh, it's actually really kind of a, a fun reading there. Uh, discussion forum, very few people seem to actually discuss much in any of my classes, but any of the questions that I get, I will repost them on the discussion forum. I'll anonymize them and then repost them under the discussion forum, because I figure if one person has a question, it's highly unlikely that that's the only person who has that one particular question. Um, so I'll post that there. And there's also mail, but again, I often don't even notice that there's mail there. So if you'd like to reach me, um, send email to my PDX email address uh, rather than anything else. Many more resources are out there. Uh, we do have <clears throat> a second edition of that textbook I mentioned before, some of the textbooks that we'll go and talk about just replication, DNA, RNA, transcription, translation, etc. all the really fascinating different ways that viruses do these things. Uh, that's by one of my colleagues, um, Vincent Racaniello, and some of his friends, um, Flint et al., sort of the standard virology text. The problem, or the main problem that I have with that is they don't talk about the most important and interesting viruses that are out there. Uh, <clears throat> but it's really concentrating on animal viruses. It's a great text, in fact, for animal viruses. But since it doesn't cover a lot of the other ones, and as we'll see a little bit later on today, the vast majority of viruses have nothing to do with animals whatsoever. Um, so <clears throat> I prefer not to use that particular textbook. Uh, there will, however, be some images that will be in some of my presentations that will come from that textbook. And again, most of that is going to be um, on reserve in the library. The holy book of virology um, is Fields Virology. That's, um, I think we're in four volumes now. It's about this much in terms of shelf space. Um, really ridiculous. I've got the second edition, which is only about that much shelf space um, in my office. Um, if you want to know a lot about any particular virus, that's really the place to look. Um, and then people are publishing constantly in the field of virology. Journal of Virology, Virology, Science, and Nature. These are all journals that PSU has a subscription to. So you can you're really excited about virology, as at least one of us is. Uh, that's a place to look. Um, I also have a library of my own in my office. Um, some of the things you may be looking for in the library, it's like, some professors check these out for forever. Yeah, that'd be me. Um, so <clears throat> that's the, the place to find them. The PSU library actually has a pretty good selection of virology books. Um, office hours, of course, are a great resource. And then yeah, you know, there's this guy here who claims to know something about viruses as well. This is a completely incomplete list of virology resources on the World Wide Web. I did want to talk about a couple of them, however, particularly this one, um, Vincent Racaniello, who has a blog 
on viruses, which is usually extremely well written. Uh, and then also has <clears throat> This Week in Virology, TWIV, um, podcast on virus research, Vincent Racaniello and his buddies. Oh, and Vincent Racaniello also has a Coursera course. Um, I have gone and looked at that quite a few times as well. Again, really concentrating on animal viruses, much more so than general environmental viruses, um, but really excellent material, which he has there as well. Um, he also, just like me, will record all of his lectures and post them on YouTube. So you can also go and take a look at some of those there as well. Uh, some more specific things, this Viper database uh, is sort of a collection of all things, or all virions, which is basically all things, uh, icosahedral. So as a really nice introduction to icosahedral symmetry, um, talks about a lot of the different viruses which are there. Uh, many of you, probably too many now, have heard about the movie that I've been trying to make for far too long um, called Edge of Life. Um, I try and post things on this movie site, which actually is just a Facebook page, uh, but probably more so now on my own lab Facebook page as well. Um, Viral Zone, this is a really nice website out of Switzerland, I think Lausanne, um, which has a nice overview on each of the individual virus families. So again, a nice resource to go and connect to as far as some of the stuff that we're talking about here. Another reason to do the family by family approach because it's a lot easier to find a lot of the resources on these kinds of things. And then the last one that I wanted to mention was the big birthday party that we had for bacteriophage um, last year. Uh, the first reporting of bacteriophage or bacterial viruses was in 1915. So last year we had a 100th birthday party of bacteriophage. The really cool thing is that People disagree about when they were first discovered, so there's going to be another big 100-year birthday party next year. <laughs> um, and that one will be in Paris. Oh, darn, I have to go to Paris. <gasps> Shots. Um, so, but this is, in fact, this particular one is really nice because all of the talks from that particular meeting, some of which are historical, some of which are really very much up to date, um, all of those are also posted and freely available. Um, you can go and take a look at that. There's also a book that they came up with for that meeting um, called Life in Our Phage World. Um, also completely available, you can download the whole thing. Um, it's pretty ridiculous, like 300 megs. Um, but um, freely available on the website there. Another couple of exciting things that we're gonna be doing here um, in this class. Um, we will hopefully talk about bacteriophage T4. Um, one of the reasons that I think there isn't something in bacteriophage T4 in our textbook is you may notice that most of the chapters are written by one or two people. I'm willing to bet that the author asked somebody to write something about bacteriophage T4 and they never got around to it. Uh, and I think I know who that person is. <laughs> that's a different story. Uh, visiting lecturers, we may well have some visiting lecturers. Um, I'm going to try and twist George Kaysen's arm into coming and talking a little bit about the virus that he works with. <clears throat> um, we may have a local expert on flaviviruses. What's the flavivirus of the month? Zika virus. So there are a number of Zika virus researchers um, here in Portland, mostly BGTI, um, so I'm trying to get one of those to come in and give one of our flavivirus lectures. Um, we'll see if that happens or not. Um, of course, the coolest viruses ever, i.e. the ones that we work with in my lab, uh, RDHV, um, RNA-DNA hybrid virus, SSVs, um, nice model here, um, STIV, sulfobus targeted icosahedral virus, um, that's the one up in the right-hand corner there. Um, we'll also talk about viruses that people didn't care about very much until a couple of years ago, Ebola, and viruses that nobody cared about until about six months ago. Um, so <clears throat> these are some of, the, some of the fun things that we're going to be talking about um, in the rest of the class. So any questions about sort of the overall what I'm going to try and do for the next 10 weeks? No? Yes? Happy? No? It's an hour earlier than we had for molecular, so everyone needs more coffee. Okay, <clears throat> so let's <clears throat> let's get started. Um, this is sort of the outline of what I'm going to try and get through in the next 
half hour or so. <clears throat> we do go to 10.05, and I will promise keep you here until 10.05. Uh, I have a nasty tendency to go even further than that, give it a chance. So we may or may not get to some of this stuff, this stuff down here at the bottom. But we certainly will talk about definitions of viruses, and one of the take-home messages, hopefully, that <clears throat> we'll get to today is that this is not a virus. This is a virion. This is the extracellular part of a virus life cycle. Uh, and so a lot of people sort of will define this as being the virus. That's not the case. Um, you really need to think about viruses in terms of their whole replication cycle. Um, the other important thing about viruses is that they're not all bad. Um, sometimes I'll give public lectures and say, you know, viruses have a bad rap. That's sort of their main issue <clears throat> here. Why should we be studying viruses? Um, I don't study viruses because viruses make people or other animals sick. I study viruses because they're absolutely everywhere. Um, and I think that's, as far as I'm concerned, a much more important reason to be studying viruses rather than that they're making people sick. And also, I don't know very much about it. So it makes it a lot harder for me to teach <clears throat> through some of these things. So I think the virus ubiquity and diversity are really, really critical and to me kind of mind-blowing in terms of thinking about our planet and what's on it. Um, we will talk a little bit about the history of virology um, today. Now, most of that has to do with well, actually how viruses make things sick um, because that's how we originally found out about um, viruses and the discovery thereof, again, about 100 years ago in terms of bacterial viruses. And not much earlier than that, in fact, I'm um, finding the very first viruses um, at all. And then if we get there, we'll talk a little bit about how you can detect a virus. Um, and virus, the easiest way to detect a virus is, unfortunately, through virus disease, which is not surprising that that's how the connections were originally made. Um, but it turns out that a lot of viruses are not causing disease. So how else can you go about discovering them? And then the whole process, again, it's not just about the virion. It's not just about the actual extracellular form. It's really about the whole process. So <clears throat> what is a virion? Um, the virion is just the extracellular part of the virus life cycle. And again, a lot of people will confuse this with virus. I'm probably one of the worst offenders as far as this is concerned. Uh, so I will try and say virion when I mean extracellular part of the virus. I'll probably try and say virus when I'm talking about the whole thing um, and the whole process. Um, I like to think of virions as bags of nucleic acid. Um, and the bag is usually called the capsid. And we'll talk a lot about capsids um, later on as we <clears throat> move through the course, that's really the shell. That's what's going on the outside, and it's almost always protein. Um, so the proteins that are on the outside that are holding things together, this is really unique. Now, this is the only found in viruses, or this whole um, virion. And then, in some cases, you'll have lipids on the outside of that protein layer. Some cases you won't. Some cases they'll be mixed, and actually it does seem as if in our case we have a mixture of of viruses and, <clears throat> sorry, in the virion envelope of both lipids and proteins. And there also are a number of virions, as you can see over here on the right, which my pointer occasionally goes to, but sometimes doesn't, um, which is just nucleic acid plus protein. Um, so these will also be called the naked virions, um, the ones that don't have an envelope, whereas the envelope ones are the ones which will have this lipid layer um, around the outside of them. Let's see, anything else I wanted to mention on here? That's sort of the main thing here. Um, how many of you recognize this reference? This is Cine Pazan Dialus. What's the reference to? This is not a pipe. This is not a pipe. Uh, who was the artist who was? Magritte, which is from which country? No, Belgium, in fact. So. Um, think of Belgium, but also Istanbul, not Istanbul, sorry, Lahore, um, Pakistan. So, but the important thing here is that Patrick Fortier, is a good friend of mine, uh, is also reminding us that this is not a virus in and of itself. 
And it's much more, not so much as the image, which is the whole idea of William I. Bates, um, and the whole surrealist movement, was <clears throat> that it's not just the virion. It's a lot more than just the virion. Um, it's the whole process um, that you go through. So what do people call viruses? Anytime Stedman puts something in quotes and puts it in red means that he doesn't believe it. Um, so <clears throat> but these are your standard virus definitions. It's a very small, quote unquote, infectious obligate intracellular parasite. So I probably should have put parasite in red here as well. Um, infectious obligate intracellular, yes. Um, I don't think anyone's going to argue with that. Uh, but the very small and parasite, I think, are some very open questions. Clearly, all viruses that we currently know of need some kind of precursors. And this is from thinking about they're going to need proteins. All viruses that we know of need proteins. That's kind of one of the definitions of a virus. Um, all of them need nucleic acid. And so they all have, just like all of us, you need to have monomers that then get made into polymers. So they need precursors for that. They need some other kind of metabolism. They need some kind of energy that comes into the cell that they're getting into. All viruses so far need cellular translation, which is, in fact, a really interesting issue and may have something to do with you know, origins of life, origins of viruses, etc. So all viruses use cellular translation. A lot of viruses don't use cellular replication. None of the cellular replication enzymes at all. But all of them are dependent on cellular translation, and all of them seem to need membranes, even those that are the naked ones that don't have an envelope around the outside in their virions. They still need membranes as well. The virion itself is never reused. This is also an, an interesting uh, aspect of things. Again, very different from cellular replication, where if you think about mother and daughter cells, you know, half of them split off. So they use a lot of the same things that they started with. Once a <clears throat> virion has been used and the genome has been released inside the cell that's being infected by that particular virus, um, the virion is no longer Use. It could be broken down into individual <clears throat> excuse me, monomers, which you end up built back up into polymers, but they're not reused. And what that means is that unlike cells, which go from 1 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 8, 8 to 16, um, they have a very different process by how they replicate. They basically go from 1 to 0 to many which is an extremely different process in terms of thinking about how all of these things come together. Textbooks will all say viruses. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, you said they're never reused. That's a very <laughs> absolute language for you. <laughs> how confident are you that they're never reused given all the diversity and ubiquity? Okay, so the, the, the question here, again, to make sure it gets recorded is, um, how certain am I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, when Stedman says always or never, he usually has a little asterisk next to it, which says, except in um, XYZ case. Uh, there are no cases that I know of, which doesn't mean they don't exist, of uh, virions being reused as complete virions. And we'll see why that is when we talk about sort of virus attachment and how the genome then ends up getting inside the cell. Usually it's an irreversible process. Um, and getting inside the cell is not surprisingly usually kind of hard because cells don't want things like virus genomes getting inside them. Uh, so it makes sense that that's not a, not a process. But at least to my knowledge, you don't have a capsid that, you know, or you'll take the, the nice example, of course, here. You know, people always think about, you know, these guys as being kind of like lunar landers, you know, come down, land, then, you know, the, the nasty things inside come out and pollute the planet. Um, but then they go back inside and leave. Now, that's not the case, which is what's happening with, with viruses. Okay, so um, these are just the very simple ones. Um, I actually prefer a much more complicated definition <clears throat> that I'm not going to go through and read. You guys all have this in your notes, etc. cetera. Um, but they're basically nucleic acid genomes that have to get inside cells, use cellular machinery, and then make virions to go somewhere else. 
And that, I think, is a much better definition than the ones that we had last time. You'll notice it didn't have very small. I'll get to you in a second. Um, doesn't have very small um, and doesn't have all the you know, parasites, anything else in there. It's just nucleic acid genomes have to get inside other living cells and then can transfer that genome to somewhere else. Yeah? Um, the slide before said yeah. they have either RNA or DNA. Mm -hmm. Is it always either or or some do they sometimes have both? Ah, so that's a um, great point here. There are a couple of cases, and so this gets to what your definition of a genome is. So what gets packaged inside the virion in a few cases, you actually have mixtures of DNA and RNA, which is in there. Um, but how the virus will actually replicate um, sometimes will go through multiple different forms. And so retroviruses, of course, are a really great example of that. Um, there's RNA, which is packaged inside the virion, but it actually has to be replicated through DNA. And there are a couple of cases where inside the virion, you have RNA and DNA, which is in there. It turns out retroviruses are an example of some of that, but there's some retroid-like viruses, which will clearly package some of both. Yeah? If they're obligate intracellular parasites, does that imply that they developed after cellular life? Or <laughs> so that's a, the, the question is basically, when did viruses arise? And that's a very interesting and controversial question. Um, it gets you to the whole definition of a virus. So if your definition is they can have to be replicating intracellularly, then yes, they have to come after cells. But there are potential virus-like replicators that people have proposed, you know, to have a time machine we're never going to know, that were potentially pre what we would currently think of as cells. Um, and we may have a chance to talk about that um, later. May not have to, we may have to talk about it um, offline. Uh, but you know, when viruses arose is a really interesting question. And there's a lot of controversy about whether they're precellular, postcellular, what those cells actually look like. Was this an RNA world kind of, of issue or not? But yeah, fabulous question. And there's no good answer to it. Any other things about virus definitions? I just wanted to get back to this, and this is hopefully, you know, going after that, <clears throat> hopefully almost dead horse by now. Um, so, si c'est un virus, this is what a virus is. It's not just the virion out here, these green guys. It's the whole process. So, you have a virion which will come, bind to a cell, release its genome inside the cell. There will be more of that genome made, the viral genome. The virions will be made. The virions will be released and go through this whole cycle again. And so this is really, when I'm talking about a virus, it's that whole process. It's not just the extracellular part. A lot of people will talk about the virion as being kind of like a seed or a spore, something which is really kind of dormant. It can't do much by itself. But as soon as it gets into the right environment, i.e. a cell, then it can replicate, make more of itself, make more of its genome, make more of the virions, and go through that process again. Yeah? Can you clarify really quick, kind of back to your question of like DNA or RNA sort of you're saying it would depend on what you define the genome as. Yes. So can you explain that a little bit uh, further? Are you saying that sometimes RNA can constitute the, the, the viral genome? Or? Okay, so the, the question here is, you know, again, clarifying again, what's DNA or RNA in terms of a virus genome? Exactly. So here, <clears throat> there are sort of two different ways to think about this. And, and we'll get, when we talk about virus classification a little bit later on, we'll talk more about this. But usually what people talk about when they think about a virus genome is what's inside the capsid, what's going to be in your virion. And in most cases, that's going to be DNA or RNA. There are a couple of cases, again, you know, David was talking about the little asterisk that goes next to it, um, where there's actually DNA and RNA, which are packaged inside a virion. But that's pretty rare. 
On the other hand, there are quite a few where we have, yeah, well, still got to work on this whole pointer thing here. Um, <clears throat> we have the genome, which is inside the virion, which would be red here, which would be one particular kind of nucleic acid. In the case of the retrovirus, this would be RNA. But when it's being replicated down here in B, it's being replicated as DNA. So what do you call the genome then? Is it the DNA copy of the genome or the RNA copy of the genome? Both of which you could sort of consider as being, you know, a reasonable way of defining it. And so that's one of the reasons why people say, okay, we're going to define the genome as what's inside the virion. And yeah, again, with very few exceptions, it's going to be DNA or RNA. Again, a few that we'll talk about right at the end where there's a combination of the two of them. Other questions on on this. So, uh, <clears throat> why should you, or why do I, uh, study viruses? Uh, viruses are everywhere, and we'll talk about that um, a little bit more in just a second. Uh, viruses infect everything. It's not just you and me and agricultural plants and our favorite <clears throat> four-legged friends. Um, viruses are insanely diverse, not only in terms of their replication patterns, but also in terms of their virions. Uh, you don't see anything like this, okay, other than no, Nerf football. Uh, but in terms of, of nature, you don't see these kinds of particles in any other form. And so that's a really fascinating process. Again, the whole virion thing is very, very different than anything else. And another reason to study viruses is they're absolutely wonderful tools. Generally, they are pretty small. And because they're pretty small, they're relatively easy to understand at a reductionist molecular biology level. And so that's one of the real reasons that I'm interested in. In fact, the reason I started working on viruses in the first place, I wanted to understand the cells that they were infecting. And using the viruses and that virus life cycle as an obligate intercellular parasite, what they've done is they take over the cell, but usually in a very simple way, and all that they care about, to totally over-anthropomorphize here, um, is going to be <clears throat> making more of the virus. The viral genome, the viral nucleic acids, the virus capsid, the virions, etc. So they're really wonderful tools. Um, yeah, sure, they, they make people sick too, but um, that's not the main reason I study viruses, even though I've got a couple of um, viral vectors here. You see they're doing their best to not spread viruses around. Um, so <clears throat> those are my favorite viral vectors. Uh, but yes, not only do they infect my daughters, um, they <clears throat> also infect all other organisms. And so hopefully this tree is not something that's new to most of you. Um, this is just a molecular representation of all cellular life. Um, and in fact, it's based on the ribosomal RNA, so it's all cellular life. Um, and there are three major groups of cellular life. We've got eukarya, and here we are, right there. This represents actually all animals at a molecular level. Um, this zea maze um, represents all plants. Um, Saccharomyces represents all fungi, so it tells you how much diversity we have in terms of molecular diversity for all the things that we think are important. Um, <clears throat> much more molecular diversity in the bacteria and the archaea. Um, I do not know of any cellular organism for which no viruses have been identified yet. Um, somebody told me C. elegans the other day. Somebody told me Saccharomyces cerevisiae the other day. Um, those have all now had viruses that have been identified either directly infecting them or infecting very close relatives. Is that a question? Yeah. SSU. SSU, yes. What does it mean? SSU. SSU, Social Studies University. No. <laughs> small subunit of the ribosome. <clears throat> so small subunit. Um, so in this case, it would be um, 16S for archaea and bacteria and 18S in terms of eukaryotes. Okay, so um, how do we know viruses are everywhere? Uh, you've probably seen this image a couple of times before. Um, I love this. It's from uh, Jed Furman's paper in Nature a few years ago now. 20. Um, but I really like this picture because basically what this is, is a sample of seawater that's been stained with a fluorescent nucleic acid binding dye. And so it binds to any nucleic acids which are there, 
and you put this under an epifluorescence microscope, and any of the DNA which is there, or RNA for that matter, although RNA doesn't stain very well under these conditions, um, will fluoresce. There's one poor little eukaryote in here. That's this diatom um, right here, it's in the, the Saturn kind of shape. Um, there are a bunch of big blobs, and these are our bacteria and archaea. What are all the other things? Virions, yes. <laughs> these are all virions, the extracellular part. So all of these guys, of course, have a bunch of viruses in them too, probably. Um, so yeah, virions outnumber everything else that you find in any environment, at least in terms of nucleic acid, by orders of magnitude. And you can do some, you know, basically count all the dots on here, or you can have some poor undergraduate or usually end up with a nice software program that will count all the dots here. And just adding them all up, you get to some really absolutely ridiculous numbers. Um, and most people agree that there's anywhere between a million to 10 million virions per milliliter in the oceans. There are a lot of milliliters of water in the oceans. <laughs> a whole bunch of them. Um, and so you can, again, do some of these back land mode calculations. You get to 10 to the 31 virions. That's an insane number. If you lined all of these pretty small virions up, one on top of each other, that's 100 million light years. That's way beyond our galaxy. It's way, it's about, you know, three quarters of the way past the Andromeda Nebula. And that's just in one cup of seawater? No, this is on Earth, the end of the 31. In a cup of seawater, it's just more than the humans. But yeah, who cares about humans? Yeah. Uh, assuming 7 billion humans, a um, cup of seawater, say 100 mils, yeah. Um, but just as a quick example here, um, I have an example from my lab. This is a, those are my fingers up there. That's my thumb. Um, here's a you know, pretty clear tube full of a bacterial virus, um, 5X174. Any ideas how many are in there without looking at your notes that you downloaded? That's 10 to the 11th virus particles in that 15 mil tube. That's just crazy. So, um, <clears throat> not quite a trillion, ahead of 12 feet. <laughs> um, but 100 billion virions in that one tube. Again, I don't know about interest you, but these numbers are just crazy. But, but one of the things that this means, um, which I think is really important, and this we'll get back to this a little bit later on, um, because you have such ridiculously high numbers of things, really infrequent events statistically will happen and will have happened a lot. So that's probably partly why when we look at the enormous amounts of diversity that you see in virions, in virus replication systems, in the genes that you find in all of these genomes, since you have these ridiculously large numbers, you can undergo really rapid evolution, even if you don't actually have very rapid numbers of changes that happen during virus replication, just because vast numbers of things which are there. And so a lot of current evolutionary biology is looking at trying to understand what's happening in evolutions of, of viruses and, and how they're moving on there. Another really important reason that Again, everybody in molecular biology can turn off for the next minute. Um, <clears throat> reason to be really interested in viruses, because basically viruses are us, much more so than anything else. There's 8% of our human genome. These are what are called the ERVs or endogenous retroviruses. Clearly 8% of our genome is viral. No one's going to argue about that. At least nobody works with these um, <clears throat> genomics. So. 8% retroviral, clearly and obviously. People will argue about whether the line and sign elements, these retrotransposons, are viral. Uh, again, we can talk a lot more about that offline. But that's 40% of our genome, which is viral or potentially related to that. And of course, the protein coding genes are 1.5%. Yeah, there's a bunch of non-coding RNA, and you know, maybe the numbers will go down a little bit in terms of what makes us human, but there's a heck of a lot of virus 
that makes us human. And in fact, the last TWIV this week in virology, there was a really fascinating discussion of a paper where they talk about uh, looking at human endogenous retroviruses, which are actually really critical for virus defense and the development of the immune system. Um, another really, I think, fascinating example of how virus infection is really important for us is the placenta. All of us, the fact that we're here is that there was a placenta that was developed. The development of the placenta is absolutely critically dependent on endogenous retroviruses, which inserted into the genes right next to what forms syncytion and allows the formation of a placenta. So placental mammals wouldn't exist if it weren't for some of these viruses that integrated into our genomes. So yeah, we're, we're viruses too, not just out in the oceans a whole bunch of virions. Um, looking at our genome, there's a lot of us, which is, is viral too. Now, if we move out of the human genome, it turns out this is true in most genomes as well. It's not just the human genome. Uh, mouse genomes act chock full of these things. Um, a lot of bacterial genomes have a lot of these uh, <clears throat> virus genomes integrated into it, even though they've got much more streamlined genomes. Um, plant genomes have a lot of viral insertion elements in them, etc. So um, it's not just the, the human genome that has a lot of these. But if we take a step back and now start to look at some of the really abundant virions that are out there, what's present inside their capsids, uh, depending on where you look, anywhere from 50 to 90% of the genes that are encoded in the nucleic acid in these viral genomes doesn't look like any other gene anybody's ever seen before. Um, so there are a couple of just references here. Um, mycobacteriophage, this is a group of uh, Graham Hatful out of University of Pittsburgh. They've um, enlisted high school students, undergraduate students, basically to go out, find dirt, um, find viruses that are in that dirt that infect mycobacterium, similar to tuberculosis, the smegmatis, because it's not a <clears throat> pathogen. 50% of the genes in all of these, and they've got now literally thousands of these genomes, don't match anything in databases, even don't match anything in the other viruses. So just crazy. And this is probably one of the best studied sets of different viruses there. Um, if you go out in the marine environment, again, that picture that I showed you of all the virions, all those extra little small dots, 90 plus percent of those don't match any of the other genes which are out there. And then if you go to some of the volcanic hot springs that, that we go in, and look for our viruses in, um, 90 plus percent of those genes, 95, and in some cases actually some viral genomes, that the whole genome doesn't look like any gene that anybody's ever found before. So really incredible amounts of genetic diversity which is out there. And so not just massive numbers of particles which are there, um, but also massive numbers of unique genes, billions of new genes. And one of my colleagues, Roger Hendricks, um, came up with this dark matter of sequence space, um, which we'll take another look at in just a second. Um, Forrest Rohrer, who's involved in some of these studies as well, says that you know, 0.0002% of phage genomes have actually been sampled so far. There's still massive amounts of diversity that we haven't even come close to sampling yet. Yeah? If, wouldn't there be, need to be some similarity with other cellular life in order to like, integrate with its machinery? So the question is, is, wouldn't there have to be some kind of similarity to cellular genes to be able to use the cellular machinery? That's exactly what you would think, that there would be some. And certainly in the case of the 50% of the genes here in the mycobacteriophage that do match other known genes, some of those are going to be similar to cellular genes. But often they're completely different. And the real question that comes up is, how are they then taking over the cellular genes? How are they modifying those cellular genes in order to make sure that they're making more of their own things? And so the really interesting question about how to address some of these things. And again, clearly a lot of these proteins are going to be something which is very specific for the virus. So there are a lot of virion proteins that clearly you're not going to have a cellular analog for. But certainly in terms of interacting with what's going on in terms of replication, transcription, translation, et cetera, how those regulatory elements are there, uh, that's a really open question. 
And so a lot of things have come up as far as that. We'll talk more about DNA polymerases a little bit later on. There are a number of people who think that DNA was invented by viruses coming out of an RNA world. Um, and so maybe actually a lot of cellular genes were viral genes originally. You know, thinking about it from the other point of view. So, and clearly there are. There's a lot of exchange going back and forth between these things. Uh, but just to go through this you know, sort of fun analogy here, the dark matter of sequence space. Um, I think Roger Hendricks is the first one to come up with this. Uh, but we did some sequencing. This is, in fact, data from my lab um, from a place called Boiling Springs Lake, Latham Volcanic National Park. It's a high temperature, low pH ecosystem. We sequenced the viral genes in there, and 93% of them match nothing. 7% do. Um, and that's actually really similar to looking at the cosmological mass energy distribution. We know something about 4% of what's out there and you know, 96% we don't have a clue. So that's where they came up with this whole you know, dark matter of sequence space thing. So <clears throat> huge numbers, extremely diverse in terms of their sequences, but also really diverse in terms of their virions. So this is just an overview of a number of different virions here. Um, dengue, which um, was the only flavivirus that most people cared about until very recently, um, is here, has a really classic icosahedral symmetric form. But that's not something that you see outside of virions, with a couple of really minor exceptions. Uh, on the other hand, you have these <clears throat> microbial viruses very often will have an icosahedrally symmetric part of them, but also helically symmetrical parts of them. Um, and we'll see why that is. Actually, it has to do with geometry. It's all about math in terms of why these virions have these particular shapes. There are some bizarre shapes as well. Um, the pox viruses, myxoma is here the example, the middle. Uh, where we have we put all these brick shaped. I wouldn't necessarily call that a brick shape, but <clears throat> more of an ovoid kind of, of virion. A number of virions can change their shapes. Um, Calpe chlorotic model virus, which is the virus that my postdoctoral advisor worked on, um, still is working on, in fact, at Montana State, um, under different conditions can change its structure. It's basically icosahedral, but will change that structure quite a bit. Um, but these are clearly very different than other things you see in biology. If you start to look at some of the viruses that infect archaea, these are the ones that are really, really bizarre in terms of their structures. Some of them have pretty similar kinds of structures to some of the bacterial viruses. Uh, panel A here, Cyan 1, has an icosahedral and helical structure is attached to it, but <clears throat> many of them have these sort of lemon-shaped or spindle-shaped structures, which the geometry we don't really quite understand yet. And we'll talk much more about this um, towards the end of the class. Um, <clears throat> and then probably my favorite are these bottle-shaped virions over here that really do kind of look like a champagne bottle with uh, some almost like birthday cake-like candles um, present at, at one end of the genome. So we'll stop here. I know this is already 10.05. How did that happen? I get going as usual. Um, we'll see you all on Wednesday.